stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief storymaker of Elkins Consulting. Many of my clients reach out to me because they're in transition. Their children are hitting milestone ages. They want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday, and they want to develop clarity about their natural strengths, what their next adventure might look like. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shaped their lives, stories that uncover patterns and may unveil insights into dissatisfaction and also where their strengths lie and where they found and continue to find joy. This podcast's intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering the internal messages that are limiting their success and discovering how to shift their stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, visit elkinsconsulting.com and schedule a one-time 90-minute StrengthsFinder session. I have another opportunity to speak with a fabulous novelist. Um, Cheryl Bostrom <clears throat> was another introduction from our dear friend Meg Nossero. And her book, Sugar Birds, I could not put down. So I'm super eager to talk to her today and to have our listeners have an opportunity to get to know her as I feel like I have as a result of a short conversation and reading her book. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me, Sarah. It's so good to be here. Well, I'm I'm excited on, on a number of levels, but one is that when I read your book, I could not put it down, but I didn't want it to end. <laughs> and I was thinking about what I should say to you in terms of what could be your next book using a lot of the similar characters because <laughs> I kind of fell in love with the characters and I kind of want to see them come back in some way. So um, do you, just before we even get started into the, the meat of the conversation, do you have another book in you? I do. I do. I've started oh. a sequel that's 20 years later and Celia and Burnaby are in that story. And it's set in Washington's Palouse, which is the uh, diagonal end of Washington state where my husband and I lived when we were first married. But it's another um, it's another adventure or a page turning novel, but layered with relationship depth and and uh, analysis of this love, not analysis, but this love story between Celia and Burnaby, who are really an unusual pair. And Aggie at this point is only making a cameo, but that could change. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> well, one of the things I was thinking was I would love a prequel to explain how the grandmother got to be where she is. A prequel to explain. Wouldn't that be interesting? The grandmother. Yeah, she would have quite a story too. That's actually a really good idea, Sarah. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to chew on that for a while. Mm, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So Cheryl, I normally would ask um, my, my guest a first question, which is, um, I'd love for you to share something about yourself that most people don't know about you. Do you have something you could share with our audience? Hmm. Well, I think it, for, for many novelists, of course, their stories end up interwoven and piecemealed throughout any type of fiction that they write, but I, I think what would be, hmm, what would be significant would be that I come from a lot of trauma and that has absolutely shaped my worldview, but in a way that I can't not write about uh, resilience and hope. Because no matter what's mm -hmm. happened, uh, that's part of who I am. And, and yeah, there are lots of little pivot moments in that story, but I don't know that we have time for that. <laughs> that's pretty general. I know it's, uh, mm. yeah, well, that so, makes sense. Yeah. So, oh, well, I've got a, I've got a piece for that. I don't know if you know anything about the Enneagram. Have you ever heard of the Enneagram? It's a person. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. OK, so anyway, it's a personality test that that even a number of theologians and spiritual directors have used in helping people understand themselves. And 
in the Enneagram, which has been statistically validated as comparable in reliability, say to Myers-Briggs, I'm a seven, which means that I have a tendency, an innate tendency to run from pain rather than address it head on. So that's been a lifelong journey for me. And I think that's probably something that people um, don't know about me. (laughs) I could see that. Yeah. Well, I could see why people wouldn't know that about you. Because it seems just even in 10 minutes of conversation with you, it, you feel like somebody who just says, okay, I've got to deal with this. Well, I've learned that, that as a young person, I moved, I went as frenetically and as quickly as I could into happy places. I mean, a bit of a Pollyanna or a bit of a, I don't know, almost a Peter Pan, but it was to escape some very dark stuff. But, you know, that doesn't work. Grief catches up with you and and sorrow needs to be faced head on. And so I've learned a sober joy, I guess. I have a great deal of optimism and, and hope in even situations that they'll take me down sometimes, but, but I get back up. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a bit about me. Well, I, I love hearing that. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it's interesting um, how much I can learn and other listeners can learn about you as a human before we even begin to have the conversation that we're going to have about your stories. So just from that one question, there's so much that we can piece together about who you are in, in, in a beautiful mosaic kind of way. So thank you for sharing that. Thanks for asking. So into your book, one of the things we started talking about before we hit record was that you just finished reading my book Mm -hmm. and you said something about a piece that kind of resonated with you. Um, Could you share that again for me, please? So our listeners can have the benefit of hearing it. Sure. Oh, there were so many gems in this book. I've got the whole thing (laughs) dog-eared. But but uh, I I liked how when you're when you're running into a difficult person or a difficult situation, to you suggested that that we step back from ourselves and as if there's a camera on how we're responding because we can't control what comes our way but we can absolutely control how we respond, and so for me that was again helpful because. Because of where I came from, I didn't have the mirroring that helps me define myself, you know, that helped me define myself as a young person. So it was like I was on this hunt for who I was. And and having that illustration in your book asking us to just film yourself and how do you want to respond to whatever comes your way was really useful to me. I love that. And it arrived as so many of these things have for me, like pieces in the jigsaw puzzle, or as you mentioned, like, like the mosaic that composes us or that helps us to see who we are becoming and how we're being shaped. Mm, That is beautiful. I could not have said that as well as you just said that. It's beautiful. And the reason I wanted our listeners to hear it is because this really does apply to your book. Um, I spoke with Suzanne um, Simonetti about her book and also uh, Leslie Rasmussen about her book. And we all agreed that there are aspects of each character that we see in ourselves. And that's how we are able to, that's how you are able to, as a novelist, as a fiction writer, really give these characters depth. So um, I'd love to hear about kind of when you're viewing it from an observation perspective, just like a camera watching you, what do you see in terms of the characters in, in your book? And how they correlate to my life? Is that what you yes, mean? and that beautiful mosaic. Because it, like <laughs> I said, as we said, each character has a little piece of us oh, yeah. in oh, yeah. in. After happily ever after, um, I know that that Leslie saw a lot of herself in both the father character, the grandfather, I mean, and in obviously the the main character, the protagonist, but also a little bit in the husband. So, yeah, I would love to hear your pieces of that. Well, and you know, Sarah, it doesn't. It, it it's not like you set out to do that. That's, right, of course not. <laughs> yeah, that's what's so that's what's so 
thrilling and engaging about writing fiction because you sit down with, oh, you know, I sat down with a story arc in mind and a general trajectory. I'm I'm neither a plotter or a pantser. I'm a hybrid of those because I do have a direction. I've got rails outside my story so that I know roughly the direction it's going to go and I don't end off uh, end up on these crazy rabbit trails. But once I immerse myself in the characters, they take on a life of their own and they become who they're going to be. And as I wrote these characters, I had no idea that Aggie was going to be sharing a sharing pieces of me as a child who, who had this deep sorrow with my siblings. We were this little pack of feral kids with a mentally ill mother who had to deal with this sorrow really unguided without anyone to process it with. And my sister and I in particular moved into the natural world. I was raised on the Olympic Peninsula in Northwest Washington state. And especially at that time, that was pretty wild country. Our our place was couched between the Olympic mountains and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And you would step out your door and you'd be in the woods or in the forest or, you know, climbing these, these hills. And, and so in the story, Sugar Birds is a story about this 10 year old girl named Aggie, who is growing increasingly bereft about her mother's advancing manic depression. And uh, her dad is a man of faith who's an arborist and lives in the woods and finds a lot of nourishment and comfort from God through the natural world. And so he teaches her to draw the nests of wild birds as an antidote to her sadness. And he teaches her survival skills. He teaches her about tracking and she's really very comfortable in the forest. So this little girl acquired knowledge that I had acquired as a kid. And then she climbs these trees to observe these nests. And my sister and I in particular, all all my siblings and I did it, and I'm the eldest of five, but um, we would climb, especially these fir trees, which are just perfect climbing trees apart from the sap. <laughs> and we would climb. To- <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come back sticky. But um, but we would climb to these really high, high places in these trees. And occasionally we would move between trees in dense forests. Aggie does it much more nimbly than we do. And so as she. Um, as she, as she spends time in the forest, that's really her home. Now, she ends up lighting a tragic fire that burns her house, and she watches her parents hauled out of this fire, and she believes she's killed her parents. So she escapes to the woods and hides in the woods, wild with grief and guilt and this huge sense of shame, believing that she is now unlovable, that she's going to go to juvie, that nobody's going to want her back. And so this whole community in love and concern is looking for this little girl and she's hiding and they can't find her because she's so skilled and she can climb. So she just knows how to get around in the woods and she evades an awful lot of many attempts to, to rescue her. So at a psychological level, I recognize that I was a lot like Aggie because, uh, because I spent the first half of my, or at least the first third of my life, evading those who would love me and bring me home because of this, because I felt, because of what was happening in my home, I felt unlovable and that I could not be treasured if anybody knew me or if anybody truly found me. And, and so that's Aggie and, and, um, and then Celia, who's the co-protagonist, and she has an alternate storyline at 16. She has a lot of anger at her parents' failures, and she makes some choices that that uh, are very threatening to her. And so then again, I step into my teenage life and the life of a lot of kids that I knew as a as a high school teacher for many years and, you know, as a mentor to a lot of young people, I've spent a lot of time with kids who don't, who aren't able to love themselves, who don't know themselves well enough yet to be able to make self-loving choices. And, and, um, and so Celia, that's part of her storyline. 
And then I had a friend the other day say, so, okay, Cheryl, she says, so who reminded you most of yourself in the book? So I kind of said what I just said to you. And then she says, you know, she says, I think you're most like Burnaby. And, uh, and I said, Burnaby, really? <laughs> And uh, Burnaby in the story, as a <laughs> who is clearly on the autism spectrum. Yeah, he's an autistic savant. And then I thought, well, you know, mm-hmm. I can get lost in the things that I'm studying or lost in the natural world. And I can build this, you know, even still, I have the tendency to put a, a barrier around me, you know, that... It, it, that yeah, I saw familiar things there, you know, and I and I love to mm-hmm. learn. Burnaby loves to learn. So yeah, you, just all sorts of components. And then now as a grandmother, mm-hmm. I hope I'm a bit like Mender. I hope that I'm developing <laughs> some of that patience and some of that ability to let the young people in my life be who they are and yet still have enough wisdom and courage to guide them, you know. But mm-hmm. we all we all screw up. So yeah, I'm a grandma who screws up. Uh. no kidding I was just talking about that with a friend who was raving about where our two young adult men are now um, because they're they're doing great things and they're both very self-sufficient they're paying their own way at 20 and 22 and that's right and that's that was the goal all along for was for them to be contributing you know self-reliant adults and I still feel grief because I, I miss them. And at the same time, I, I have that sense of joy and, and gratitude. But one of the things we talked about was how the community helped shape who they are, that it wasn't just their parents, because we nurtured a community of people who could help guide our boys, partly because we knew we couldn't be all things to them. Absolutely. And because and because we knew that uh, we wouldn't want to be all things to them, they they need to be able to have social impact and social relationships. And so it, it was interesting. We were talking about the things that I did that were that I feel like I messed up on, but we had the safety net of a community to help guide and and deliver them to where they are now. Oh, and you just see their you see their belovedness, you know, and and as you watch other people love your children and step in where you're unable to do it, it's just the richest, most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there were times with my kids where, well, first off, my, my prayer and my goal when I was raising my kids was that I would not continue the patterns that I had experienced. And yet uh, to think that you can just flip a switch, you know, we waited a while to have kids and fortunately we had those additional years, but still, you know, you're always learning and you're always growing. And there are places of your story that have to come into focus as the years pass. And so there were, there were times with our kids when I got lost in, in, in still got lost in who I was and the, the capabilities that I had to to love them through stuff and like you say there were others who were able to do that for them you know and and uh i have lovely relationships with my kids and and they're marvelous adults with their own families and so i trust that as a as an assembly of all of those people loving them that they have become who they are and i'm really thankful like you i love that That is such a beautiful part of our stories when we think about the trajectory of our lives and how we create these mosaics of our lives, being able to acknowledge, as you said earlier, before we hit record, you were talking about being self-reflective and how painful that can be. And I do, I look back and I think, wow, you know, I, I really messed this part up with my boys or my niece or whoever it was, a good friend. And then I really think hard about what I could have done differently, if there was anything I could do differently. Mm-hmm. And I, I keep coming back to, I can be a better person every single day. Mm-hmm. Well, and I've said to my, I've said to my daughter, you know, I did, you know, we, as parents, cause she's a parent of two beautiful kids now. And, uh, and, and I said to her a while back that, you know, we all do what we can with what we know right now, but you know, a few years down the road, we know more and we can do better. And, and, uh, 
I, when I was doing some of my work early on in my thirties, um, you know, as I was trying to untangle this web of stuff that I'd grown up with, uh, the, the wise counselor that I spent time with, um, he said, you know, I've seen an awful lot of, of, um, problematic parenting, uh, healed later. You know, it's, you're never, we're never finished and these relationships are ongoing. And a lot of it has to do with our ability to forgive ourselves. And depending on what one's relationship is with God or what you believe about that, you know, for me, he's been, you know, huge in that, but the, um, the, um, the story sugar birds, Aggie, has so much guilt and so much shame that until she's able to forgive herself, she won't be able to receive love. And, you know, her, her arc in the stories is a big part of that. And, you know, guilt or unforgiveness skews our worldview so badly that we don't see ourselves clearly and we don't see others clearly to the extent that there were people who treasured Aggie would do anything for her would do anything to find her. And she absolutely saw, would not see them in that light. She only saw them as people who wanted to, um, you know, to capture her and stow her away, mm -hmm. you know, and to punish her. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am so glad that you brought this to my attention because I read the story as, as a story. And this is not something that I've had to struggle with. This is not, um, this is not a part of my story, this, um, inability to feel lovable. And so the way that you just describe this as analogy mm -hmm. uh, is just an incredible eye opener for me. Mm -hmm. This analogy of, of Aggie not wanting, not being able to see that love because she had so much self-loathing and, and anger toward herself, shame, and what's really interesting to me that just popped into my head is that the one person she allowed in was a stranger. And, and there are two parts to that. Celia didn't know Aggie before Aggie disappeared. But Celia, I just got a chill thinking about this. <laughs> Celia, who's 16, somehow knows Aggie because she's, she's with her. She has had uh, similar feelings for herself. How could I be so unlovable? And no one who knows Aggie is able to break through. And I wonder if it's partly because Celia's perspective of Aggie is so um, connected to her own that she's able to speak Aggie's language in a way no one else who loves her dearly can speak it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> that's that's it's huge in there. And and the fact that these girls have both been in vastly different ways. Aggie's losing her mother through mental illness and her, you know, and both parents through this fire. She, so she believes and Celia through her mom's abandonment and then what she perceives as her dad's abandonment. They both have have this huge loss and are responding to this loss that uh, it's almost like pher pheromones. You know how you know how people are drawn to one another, and you oftentimes mm -hmm. see couples either through their health or through their unhealth are drawn to one another. These girls um, really end up nourishing each other and and healing at different levels because of their familiarity. I think that's exactly right, Sarah. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> you don't plan. Well, you don't plan it. You just write it and you go, oh, wow, there it is. <laughs> that kind of works. Well, and that's, I think some people plan it. You know, they think through the, the message they want behind the book. Mm -hmm. But other, other fiction writers, they write what comes out. I mean, it's just, I think it just comes to you and there is a subconscious level to it that the lessons are there. But the beauty of this that I'm seeing in our discussions and in my discussions with the other authors I mentioned is that the reader gets to come to their own conclusion. Mm -hmm. It's not an in-your-face lesson, but without 
having spoken with you, I would have missed this entire aspect of my learning, which guaranteed will help me in my relationships with others who are experiencing what I haven't experienced, to be able to put this together and apply it to something real and tangible and relationship oriented. I love that. Well, and when you think of all four characters, and like you say, there, there, this isn't an in-your-face book, but it does illustrate how each of these four young, the four young characters in the book, end up uh, addressing their own traumas. How do they? How do they deal with sorrow? How do they deal with trauma? You know, Aggie. Aggie really questions the God her dad has taught her about, and she runs. She hides in the things that are beautiful to her. Um, Celia resorts to anger and retaliation. And Cabot becomes a victim or chooses victimhood and, and um, you know, to, to retaliate or to respond um, angrily or vengefully toward things that he feels are beyond his control, but he's, he remains a victim, you know, and then Burnaby almost tries to resurrect his life himself, you know, his work with it, with the bones and his eccentric hobbies and the things that he does with, uh, with his paintings. He is trying to recreate his own world rather than trust anybody else to handle it. And aren't those all things we do? <laughs> yes, we do it every day, yeah. not as children, but as adults. We all yeah. take on those different responses to trauma and, and just general challenges in our lives. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, which brings us full circle back to this idea that you um, you, you associate yourself with the seven in the Enneagram, which is the person who is generally very positive to, um, sometimes to a damaging mm -hmm. effect of not dealing with conflict, not dealing with grief. And when we bring this all together with the way these four young people address their, their grief and their sorrow and the, the uncertainty in their lives of what they think should be happening that isn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, when we pull that back together, when you think about a pivotal moment where you were able to see that in yourself, can you think of a particular incident where you saw it and you did something differently as a result? Uh, I have a, I have a few actually, but one, one happened. Um, to me as a, as a young woman, and you may not see the correlation right at first, but it had a lot to do with, with choices that I made. And um, I was a pretty precocious child. I, 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 I was raised back in the days when they're testing IQs and they're having kids skip grades. And so I was very young for my class. I was a 16 year old senior. And, uh, and, and yet because of the chaos in my life and because I was living as if I were dodging, I, well, not as if I were, I was dodging emotional, uh, emotional bullets, you know, physical stuff. Um, I had, a, it was a lot, it was a big challenge for me to concentrate and to, uh, I, I guess, to perform to the capabilities that I had. And I always thought that um, it was almost as though I expected excellence to be like eye color, that because I was told I was smart, because I was told I was capable, I just kind of expected that to happen. But I was raised in a home where we didn't, studying was never talked about. I mean, you were fortunate to, you know, to sit down and eat dinner and get to bed without some type of something happening. And so, so it was a, it was a pretty post-traumatic stress situation going on in my body and in my mind. And when I started doing my graduate work and just started entering these things, these times where I couldn't just stay up all night and crank out a paper or where I couldn't just go into class by the seat of my pants and graduate, you know, graduate with honors, but not highest honors. I almost used, um, used what were failures for me 
as um, I almost used my procrastination as an excuse for why I couldn't do as well as everybody thought I could. And so then I felt fraudulent again, see, and then I felt unlovable. Mm -hmm. But the pivotal moment for me was when I, when I, when I turned in my master's thesis and one of the guys on my committee said, this is brilliant. He called it brilliant. And I thought (sighs) it wasn't brilliant because I did it by the seat of my pants. I took months to write this thing. I spent so much time on it. And I thought, you know, I don't have to be smart. I can be persistent. (laughs) And and then then it dovetailed with, you know, and you talk about this in your book, it dovetailed with this resilience that no matter what has happened, it isn't just about natural abilities or eye color or capabilities. It's about what you choose to do with what you have. And that was life-changing for me. It was life. So I can just imagine your expression and how many days afterward you were still processing this experience of this person on the committee saying that your work was brilliant. Do you yeah. remember that? Like, oh. I, yeah, I can feel it. This vivid yeah. memory. Yeah, I can still get. I can still get shivers thinking about it because always before when I would be complimented on something, I would dismiss it because I felt fraudulent because I didn't have the study skills or the you know I wasn't doing what I dodged doing. Does that make sense? And yes. So- and it's <laughs> ironic though. I mean, it's ironic though, because, and I say this because as a strengths finder coach, one mm-hmm. of the things I remind people of is that there are some things that come really naturally for us because mm-hmm. of the way our brain works. And those are wonderful things, but we always dismiss the compliments on those particular things that come so naturally yeah. instinctively to us. And that's, yeah. that's kind of silly that we can only own a compliment when it's about something we had to work really hard to do. Oh, yeah. 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 But do you see the freedom in it too? Yes. There's huge freedom because it involves choices. It's not not just something you were handed, you know, and I am very grateful for the gifts that God has given me. I'm very grateful. Um, and, And as the years have gone by, instead of refusing the compliment, I direct them to him for things that come naturally, you know? Oh, but. But uh, but when you're able to work hard on something and you're able to choose that and do that, and, you know, it's action, reaction, choice, consequence. And, oh, that's right. liberating. so liberating. It is. And we can choose to do those things that come naturally better, to right. continually improve those gifts. Right. And that's what you did. It's not that you worked so hard without the foundation of intelligence and and guidance, um, you worked so hard and you had those natural gifts. And I think that's a really important distinction. You didn't work against your gifts. And, oh, and interesting. Yeah. just as an example, um, I, one of the stories I tell about trying to write my book was that I don't have any of the executing domain within StrengthsFinder in my top talents. Oh. Um, And so I had a really hard time keeping myself accountable and focusing to get my book done. And when I reviewed my StrengthsFinder results, I saw focus was number 28 on my list out of 34. (laughs) (laughs) And it was hard. And I kept trying to be the writer that everyone describes in the books and the articles about how to write your book was, it was all around routine, about creating a routine and doing things, you know, focusing. Focus was a big word in all of the articles I read that my family so graciously shared with me trying to be helpful. (laughs) And it wasn't until I looked at my strengths and thought, saw strategic activator and adaptable in my top five and thought, there's no way focus is going to work for me. I could do it, but it's not going to be inspired. Yeah. And I think we have to use our natural talents in order to inspire that greatness. Mm. So instead of trying to do a routine, which doesn't fit who I am with my adaptability and my talents, I'm really good at switching gears quickly. I created a strategy that helped me finish my book without having to do it like everyone else does it. I love so, that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that just because they're natural talents doesn't mean we 
didn't have to work to make them great, to make them applied and useful in our daily lives. Yes, and that's not something that necessarily comes to the school system because as a, as a teacher, you know, we're we're limited in the in our approaches because we're dealing with large numbers of kids. And and uh I was never one who could follow the linear course. So I I you know, I, I'm more like a camera mm-hmm. lens coming into focus. And you know, the you talk about the quick switch and and the you know your adaptability. And so just to give yourself permission to do it differently, it's just, that's just fantastic, Mm -hmm. Sarah. You know, my husband um, is a, is a veterinarian and he's an embryologist. And so he spent, you know, much of his career doing embryo transfer for cattle. And early on, he wanted me to help him. You know, I would go to farms with him and spend time, you know, when he was working, I'd love to spend time with him. But at first he would have me look in these Petri dishes in these high powered microscopes to locate these embryos. And he very quickly realized that this, this <laughs> that wasn't a good job for you. No, no, <laughs> it was just a little dangerous for me to be handling these Petri dishes. So, yeah, so we just, it's, it's what, you know, let's, let's work with our strengths and make the other stuff function as, as needed, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I'd my love- guess just based on this conversation is that you are really good at seeing a process that doesn't work very well and fixing it. Yeah. Fixing it or leaving it, you know, just choosing not yeah. to, choosing not to participate because life's too short. And, and remember mm-hmm. I'm a runner, you know, <laughs> you know it's uh, it's been a long-term process to just say, okay, I need to stick with this, but I'm not going to stick with this, or I am going to do it differently. Mm. Like you, I'm pretty flexible and pretty adaptable, but I had to be. So, Right. Of course. And we all wonder, is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it both? Is there one that's stronger than the other? I mean, the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn what we don't know about humanity and our, our energy and the way that we Um, make decisions and grow. But I am so grateful for this conversation, Cheryl. I'll be thinking about it for days, particularly the, um, that analogy of Aggie running away from people who love her because she is, she can't accept it. I'm going to keep thinking about Celia and her role in bringing Aggie back into the fold of love and, and family And I would love to hear one more story from you. Another pivot point um, related to the book. When you decided this was your first novel, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the moment where you thought, oh my gosh, I can do this. I'm going to publish a book. Mm, This, the, the big thing for me was the switch from nonfiction to fiction because I have, I've written two, I, I, I have, have two nonfiction books published and I've done an awful lot of short form work and had helped a lot of other people with their books. But uh, I think I realized that I really uh, could go the, could go the distance with this book that I wanted to go the distance and make it really a beautiful piece of literary fiction or upmarket fiction because it has a compelling plot was, was um, when the book uh, I entered the manuscript in a, in a couple of contests before it was published and um, recognizing that that has promotional value. Should the book come to fruition and it, it won both of them. And I I took it to one editor and she said, uh, she said, yeah, the book's good to go, but there was just something niggling at me you know, there were, there were rough spots. There were lack, there was lack of subtlety. I wanted more layering. And I think when I had, I sent it. So then I sent it in, I'd heard about this editor um, in Brooklyn who had worked with the author of the help. Do you remember the help? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and Lilac girl, she edited that book too. And her name was Alexandra Shelley. And on a long shot, I wrote to her and I told her about the book and I, I asked her if she would by any chance have time to work with me because I knew I needed to know more. I knew I didn't know what I didn't know. 
Mm -hmm. And so I sent it off to her and fully expecting her to say no, you know, realizing it was a long shot. But she told me the story mesmerized her that she was captured by these characters. Mm -hmm. And so something started to dawn in me. And I don't know, it it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't require somebody else to tell you that your work has merit, but it did. I, I needed, I needed that. So, but she also told me, so, so this dovetails with everything we've been saying. She also told me that she would love to work with me. She had an opening in a couple of months, but she says, but your, your process is going to be arduous. Your revisions are going to be arduous and your learning curve steep. Well, everything that had happened up to that point had prepared me to go into it anyway. Mm -hmm. And it was like this, it was like a one-on-one MFA, her instruction. And mostly it was asking me questions or saying, what about this? And sending me, or, or being very insistent that certain things didn't work. But I was ready for that, even though I would get her material back and I would say to my husband, Blake, I don't even know what she's talking about. (laughs) but you take it apart piece by piece yes yes but the moment that she wrote back to me and said that she would work with me but that I was going to have to work hard said to me it's Sarah this now I'm getting shivered it's just what you had said it's it's like she was affirming my capabilities but she was saying we have a lot more to do and and isn't that the story of our lives we we have these capabilities at whatever point we start, what be they large or small, but we have a lot more to do and we can do it. And that's what's mm. <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. And I, I know that it is hard to understand that sometimes we need that external remark. We need the external support and encouragement. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. As long as we're looking for it in the right places, by mm-hmm. sending it to an editor of that stature, Mm-hmm. That is that's important to get that feedback to say this is good. It's mesmerizing. It still has a long way to go, and it's awesome. Like hearing that from that particular person. As long as we're looking in the right places mm-hmm. for that external encouragement and um, confirmation, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I love that. Well, and it's both and. It's not either right. or. And it's right. not, and it's not that we're starting from this hollow emptiness that needs infusion of everything we are from outside. That we have this this personhood that's beautiful, and mm. and, and these things that we can do that are treasures. Um, but let's work with it. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful way to end this conversation, Cheryl. Tell our listeners where they can get a hold of you, where they can get a hold of the book. And just so our listeners know, I will be adding this to the podcast blog associated on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. Okay. Well, I would love to have you come over to cherylbostrom.com. That's C-H-E-R-Y-L-B-O-S-T-R-O-M.com. And I am a photographer as well. And I post a lot of pictures and a lot of musings and book reviews and And we would just be spending time together and you can write to me from there. And I'd love to hear from you. And the book is available everywhere. And it's also an audio book. Jane Entwistle, who she's got four pages of books on Audible and she's won Odyssey Awards and Earphones Awards. She's a great narrator. So she did the book and uh, she's captivating. (laughs) Oh, excellent. Thank you. And I love a good audio book for a road trip, which I think I might have one coming up. So I might have to listen to it as well after I've already read it. I cannot wait to share all about this book as we move forward with this podcast when it's published. Cheryl, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. 
It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you. Thank you.